Dr. Jamal Wakim, thank you very much for accepting my invitation on Solana Analysis. It's uh, really uh, uh, to be your host. Uh, and uh, a lot of my viewers and followers are expecting uh, for your, your insight about a very important topic uh, in Nagumo Karabakh, in Armenian we say Artsakh. And today we are going to talk about the Iranian position, uh, which in my opinion is a little bit bizarre uh, concerning the Artsakh situation. Uh, the first yeah. question I received from uh, a follower on Syrian analysis, uh, it says uh, the Iranian side expressed uh, concerns during the uh, recent Artsakh war due to the deployment of radical Islamists, especially uh, the mercenaries that Erdogan sent from Syria into um, the Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh region. Mm -hmm. However, when the war uh, ended, an advisor to the Supreme Leader, uh, Khamenei, Khamenei, congratulated Baku for the quote-unquote liberation of uh, parts of Artsakh, even mm -hmm. compared the Armenians to the Israeli occupation, and he compared them to the Zionists. Uh, how do you mm. see this contradiction of the position, uh, the Iranian position? Well, uh, we there are a lot of factors that uh, affected the stance of the uh, Iranian leadership. Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, there is the geopolitical, from the geopolitical perspective, I believe that, uh, and uh, based on prior experience, previous experience, the uh, Iranians were supportive of the uh, Armenians, especially that Armenia uh, served uh, in geopolitical terms as a link between Iran and Russia. Okay, so uh, 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 this dates back to the early 1990s, uh, especially at the time when uh, Turkey was trying to uh, uh, use Azerbaijan as a bridge towards uh, Central Asia. In addition, uh, Azerbaijan, the support of Israel to Azerbaijan is aimed at also uh, damaging or, uh, let's say, uh, uh, undermining the national security of Iran for several uh, reasons. Uh, first and foremost, um, well, uh, we need to first uh, admit the fact that uh, uh, Azerbaijan is uh, very special to the Iranian national security. Uh, 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 Iran consists of like 60% uh, uh, Persians uh, or 61% uh, Persians. 17% uh, uh, Azeris, 10% Kurds. And it was the Azeris, uh, the Safavids, who were Azeri Turkmans, who converted Iran into Shia Islam in the early 16th century. So uh, the Israelis and the Americans are very uh, aware of these facts, and they know that destabilizing Iran could uh, be initiated from the northwestern part of Iran, which was the point from which the Safavids uh, uh, initiated the unification of Iran under one banner in the early 16th century and converting in, uh, Iran into Shia Islam. So that's one uh, factor. Another factor that we need to uh, taking consideration is that the Kurdish uh, regions uh, in Iran, uh, they are neighboring or contingent to the other uh, regions. So uh, uh, the uh, Israelis had in mind while uh, when they uh, uh, strengthened their uh, ties to uh, Azerbaijan, they had in mind to use this as a factor to destabilize Iran from the northeast, uh, northwestern uh, region. Uh, so the Iranians are very sensitive to these issues. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, uh, Azerbaijan is uh, also uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, 
let's say, special uh, uh, factors that play off uh, in Iran, uh, especially that the other elite is very influential in Iran. Imam Khamenei himself it said that he is from Adari descent, from the side of his father. So this is one factor. So on one hand, uh, there was this support for Armenia, uh, but on the other hand, there were lo- uh, uh, all these other issues. Uh, at the same time, what played a role in uh, fomenting this um, Iranian, uh, let's say, stance towards the latest crisis, I believe it was the uh, strong relations with Erdogan, the uh, AK party and Erdogan. When Iran supported Armenia in the uh, 1990, 1994 war, uh, at the time, um, uh, Turkey was under the rule of secular parties. And uh, for Turkey, for for Iran, there was no, uh, there were no good relations, strong relations with the uh, Turkish Republic, which was considered as an evil uh, republic because of its secularism. Uh, Starting from the uh, uh, from 2002 onward, and despite the Syrian crisis, there were strong relations that were forged between the Iranians and the AK party, and especially with Erdogan kinship. Uh, it's noteworthy that it, in 2010, between 2010 and 2012, uh, the, the banks controlled by the son of Erdogan, uh, Najmuddin Bilal, were the banks that uh, helped uh, Iran circulate over $230 billion U.S. dollars uh, uh, and, uh, let's say, avoiding or uh, the, the U.S. sanctions. Uh-huh. And this is what uh, made or rendered the Americans angry with Erdogan uh, at, the, uh, at the time, they, um, uh, let's say, pressured the, the, um, the Turkish judiciary to move on against Najmuddin Bilal, and Najmuddin Bilal had to run away to Italy, seek refuge, despite the fact that his father was prime minister. He was only to return to Turkey and regain his influential role uh, uh, in the aftermath of the failed coup d'etat in 2016. Uh, uh, during which the uh, uh, Erdogan uh, waged, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a campaign against, against his opponents and put them, put over 100,000 people, including judges, uh, professors of university, and uh, uh, army officers in jail. So uh, I believe that these relations played a role in affecting the Iranian stance, especially at a time when Armenia was ruled by the pro-Western Pashanyan. Uh So uh, for the Iranians and for the Russians, I believe that this played a role in the Russian stance. They became hesitant to support Armenia with a leadership that is pro-Western, that uh, took over power or uh, access power uh, via a colored revolution, uh-huh. uh, the type of revolution that the Iranians are wary of. So I believe that this mistrust of the Armenian leadership added to the other factors that I listed before played a role in this uh, stance uh, especially that the Iranians were trying to contain the Azeris and not push them totally over to the hands of the Israelis and the Americans. Doctor, and this- I believe that this was also the Russian stance. And too bad this affected the stance of the 
Iranians and affected the faith of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh. Doctor, these are very important factors that you already mentioned, and I believe uh, the Armenians should really carefully analyze what you said in order to avoid, uh, let's say, f uh, future uh, miscalculations or mistakes, because um, I posted on Twitter and I said, this is the last mistake the Armenians are allowed to make, because 100 years ago they lost one and a half million Armenians, and they lost some Armenia, and now they lost the most parts of Artsakh, and the next step could be losing the entire Armenia, especially now. Um, I hope not. Aliyev, Aliyev, uh, Aliyev in the so-called victory uh, parade, he spoke about uh, the entire Armenia. He was talking about Iran, and he was talking about Sionik, he was talking about Armenia as part of Azerbaijan. Now, uh, building on, your, on the factors that you already mentioned, the second question that I think is about Israel, because Israel supported and still supports uh, Baku in this conflict, and uh, it directly helps uh, Baku, let's say. And uh, there was a huge cargo of weaponry uh, flying from uh, Tel Aviv to uh, during, the, during the war, and uh, sending uh, experts to train the Azeris uh, on using the deadly drugs uh, against the Armenian defense forces. How much? Uh, Iranians should be concerned about the um, these improved relations, increased uh, relations, mm -hmm. uh, the ties between Baku and Tel Aviv. Uh, well, they are concerned, and I believe that this made them a bit hesitant to take a strong stance against Azerbaijan at a time when they are mistrusting, for example. The, lead, the Armenian leadership, huh. especially from the uh, uh, Israeli perspective, what they did or the 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 crisis in uh, Artsakh uh, occurred only a few days after or a few weeks after the uh, normalization of relations between Israel and UAE. Uh -huh. And this had formally put Israel uh, uh, on, on, the out, on the outskirts, southern outskirts of Iran. Uh -huh. So from a geopolitical perspective, if we see it from an Israeli perspective, what they did, or uh, the support to Azerbaijan and uh, the crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which eventually served in strengthening the position of Israel, from my perspective, uh, looked like a pincer movement, uh -huh. south and from north, in order to besiege Iran. So, uh, because the American strategy is to use surrogate powers like UAE in order to contain Iran from the south and block Iran and by extension Eurasia, Russia and China, from having access to the Western Indian Ocean. And at the same time, by making a breakthrough through the Caucasus into Central Asia, uh, uh, get to a region that would serve to destabilize all three uh, major Eurasian powers that are China, Russia, and Iran. So, from a pure geopolitical perspective, I believe that the Iranian stance should have been stronger in its support to Armenia, despite their mistrust of Pashanyan, However, I believe that it was the, the, their stance was tainted by the other factors, which, on the long run, would not serve uh, Iranian national security. Mm -hmm. Doctor, you already uh, like mentioned the role of, uh, I mean, Pashinyan and his pro-Western stances. Uh, I've been addressing this issue uh, recently on my channel, and some let's say Armenians, called me conspiracy uh, serious, and they say uh, it. Uh, what I'm saying is a conspiracy. So I would like also to ask for your opinion, because 
um, I see and I can read, and it's it's on the, on the web page of all these Soros organizations, Net National Endowment for Democracy, USA. All these organizations they post on their websites that they are providing uh, financial support to NGOs in Armenia, media outlets, journalists, politicians. Mm -hmm. How much do you think the expansion of these uh, NGOs in Armenia uh, has alarmed uh, Iran and Russia to extend? Definitely. Into extent, like I was watching um, Russian media, and Pashinyan called uh, Putin, I believe, on the fifth day of the war, and Putin he recorded the conversation with Pashinyan, and he. Old Pashinyan that I'm busy because I'm having a conversation with my ministers. I call you later, and he dropped the phone. I mean that's symbolic, but it has we can analyze the body language of Putin and how he uh, missed Pashinyan. Do you really believe that Pashinyan uh, came to power after a color revolution, which was embraced by all these NGOs who are playing now in Armenia? Well, this is something that he admits himself, that he came after a colored revolution two years ago, supported by the NGO activists who are financed by USAID. Mm -hmm. And USAID is, an, is not a neutral actor. It's associated with the NSC, National Security Council. And we know of its experience and the colored revolutions throughout the Arab world and Previously, back in the 1970s and 1960s, and all coup d'etats that occurred in Latin America. So it's no secret. It's a common, uh, it became common knowledge uh, or common uh, information. So definitely for the, Ura uh, for the Iranians who suffered from an attempted colored revolution on several occasions and who are witnessing a colored revolution in Iraq and a pseudo colored revolution in Lebanon, okay, financed mainly by NGOs, by, by, uh, by European and American NGOs. And when they see that the same occurred in Armenia, I believe that this had affected their uh, firmness in. Uh -huh. supporting the Armenians. Had it been uh, a different leadership, maybe it would have drawn more support from both the Iranians and the Russians. So, and Dr. we need to see it, we need to see it. What, not what is a color revolution for starters? If, if, if you want to just uh, like summarize in few words, what is color revolution? Well, it's a revolution the likes of the uh, Georgia revolution that ousted the uh, Chavarnadze and uh, came up with the Saakashvili, for example, the, U uh, the Ukrainian revolution. It's a sort of civil protests, a wave of civil, the, the, the Lech Walesa movement back in the 1980s. So it's, uh, if you go back in history, back to the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, and uh, this was published in uh, books, including the one that I bought from Canada uh, uh, under the title "The Cold, uh, the Cultural Cold War," and how, uh, starting from the 1950s and 60s, the Americans, uh, the CIA mainly, uh, recruited Trotskyists. Uh, who were angry with Stalin and the Soviet model of communism. They recruited them uh, because they thought that they could uh, fight fire with fire. Mm -hmm. And they created a liberal uh, version of Marxism uh, and promoted French Marxists to be an alternative to Soviet Marxists. And uh, uh, the first colored revolution in history was the 1968 revolution in France against uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle back then. And the, 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 the main figures uh, were back then the young 
uh, Bernard Henri Levy and uh, Cohen Bandit back then. So uh, they tried a similar colored revolution in Egypt against Nasser in March 1968, but it failed. They tried the uh, uh, Prague Spring with Dubček and uh, it seems that there is a certain fixed formula. Uh -huh. So they always use the spring, uh -huh. Arab spring, uh, Prague spring, uh, okay. Uh, like they, use, they use civil movements, uh, small groups, active groups that could lead uh, the uh, crowd uh, against, well, based on uh, justified complaints, of course, uh, against the governments in order to topple them and uh, uh, generate an alternative agenda that would be more compliant to the Western interests. And we saw in all cases that all, cool, uh, all colored revolutions uh, played in favor of the geopolitical agenda of the United States and the West in general including uh, the 2003 and 2004 Georgian and U Ukrainian revolutions, uh, the Arab Spring and what happened uh, during this Arab Spring, how small groups could um, uh, infiltrate uh, the protests that, are, that were justified and legal against corrupt uh, regimes. However, they, because of their financing and their organization, they could divert these movements towards a set agenda. And uh, this is what happened actually with uh, Pashinyan. Uh -huh. This is how he uh, got to power. And I believe that this had jeopardized the destiny of Armenians who lost their um, strongest and fiercest supporters who are the Russians and the Iranians. Uh -huh. Doctor, um, this is my last question to you because I'm really, really interested about this topic. Like the American side, the EU side, they use soft power through these NGOs in order to gain the hearts and the minds. And this is their right to support these mm -hmm. NGOs because at the end, this is a geopolitical game and they want to expand their influence into other countries. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, the alternative for the Western uh, civilization of the Western influence is the Russian, Iranian, and the Chinese, or maybe sometimes Indian. But till until this moment, I personally, I don't see these examples attractive for the youngsters. If you go to Armenia, even if you are not pro Pashinyan, or you go to Ukraine, even if you're not pro the colored revolution, it's always like. When you tell them you have the Russian example and you have the EU example, which one would you choose? The EU example is not more attractive to them. So do you agree Russia is not really working on the soft power uh, in order to also infiltrate the societies and spread uh, pro-Russian sentiments or, or, or convince the people for the Eurasian unification and uh, etc.? Well, uh, I can understand uh, the taste of the Armenian youth. I myself studied throughout my life in French schools, American universities, and French universities. So I should be sympathetic culturally or affiliated culturally with the West. However, things are not a matter of taste. Mm -hmm after all. And of course, by nature, we tend to like the sophisticated, and usually the sophisticated is the richer. Yes. So Western societies, they are more liberal because they are more, they, because they are richer. They have more capabilities. They can afford to be tolerant. If we put it on a smaller level, okay? A rich father is not better than a poor father, but he has better means and capabilities to spend and spoil his kids. So the sons of a poor father would look with admiration 
to the way a rich father would be dealing with his kids until he gets poorer. And this is what's going on with the West now. Mm -hmm. Look at what the Americans are doing to their own people, especially after the outburst of protests and the economic crisis that hit the country due not only to the coronavirus, but to structural problems. So for the Armenian youth, it's not a matter of taste who they like or who they dislike. It's a matter of destiny. And the Armenia is besieged by hostile countries. Turkey from the west, Azerbaijan from the east, and Georgia uh -huh. from the north. Yes. So what they tried their lot. Pashinyan was pro-Western. He tried his lot, and especially when Putin offered him mediation, he told him, no, we will fight on. And this led to this catastrophic result later on. Uh -huh. Because Pashinyan hoped or thought the West would tender support to him. But nothing came. It was very similar to what happened almost 100 years ago. Uh, which ended in the catastrophe that we know of. So, the okay, you can like the West. You can like the uh, genes or Western music. But what would you like for your own country? Yes. This I, is also live, I also live in the West. And I like some of the aspects of the Western civilization, but that doesn't mean that I like their foreign policy or I like what they do in our own countries. I also studied in different universities, also studied in France. And if France uh, bombs Syria, it doesn't mean that I have to be with France, like as you mentioned. Because, or Armenia, for example. Yes, some people are really... Uh, I know I, that Maybe I'm, I'm uh, a bit more uh, radical. And this is done. So yes. <laughs> I, I decided never to set foot in the United States as long as it's an imperialist power. So uh, I'm, not I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if, if, if I'm also able to go to the United States. If I'm allowed to go there, maybe I'm also on the blacklist uh, because of my uh, constant criticism of the American imperialism. And I know that I told you this is the last question, but today I tweeted. And I said, um, while uh, the hostile neighbors of Armenia, namely Azerbaijan and Turkey, are adopting a fascist uh, style, mm -hmm. um, when your neighbors are doing this and you're spreading neoliberalism in your country, uh, namely Armenia, that means you are preparing yourself for the next invasion uh, to go to fight the fascists with a knife, with a, with a spoon and a fork. And you're really depriving the country of one of these things, which is national identity. And do you agree that during wars, national identity and such strong ideologies play a role uh, against a fascist? Uh, yes, definitely, because, uh, well, I'm against fanatism. And uh, I believe that we need to be open to all cultures and civilizations. However, uh, being open to cultures is one thing, but accepting uh, hostile foreign policies is another thing. So for Armenia, it's a matter of uh, survival. Okay, we're talking about 3 million Armenians next to 100 million Turks and others. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and there is an alliance between Turkey and Azerbaijan. So, what is your guarantee in any upcoming confrontation? There is. Uh, well, uh, part of our understanding of politics is to understand the mindset and psychological. Uh, uh, structure, let's say. Uh, so uh, I, I always wondered why the Armenians had, the Armenians in Lebanon, for example, had this strong uh, tendency to emphasize their identity all the time. And 
based on my, uh, let's say, studies, uh, um, I try to understand Armenian history, especially the effects of the genocide. So this people was about to get exterminated, and this is why uh, they had to focus on their national identity as a mean to survive, as a mean to keep the heritage in diaspora. So it's uh, a practical thing. I, uh, I believe it's a practical thing uh, uh, dictated by necessity. Uh, and I believe that this uh, this attitude is very similar to the attitude of the Palestinian people who were subject to the same uh, fate and who uh, uh, are keen on insisting or focus, uh, uh, stressing their national identity as a mean to overcome attempts of extinction by the Zionists. So, uh, of course, identity changes over time, but it, it's, uh, there is a difference between uh, a change and evolution of an identity mm -hmm. and an attempt to wipe out an identity. Yes, abandoning is different from developing your identity. Okay. So, I, well, for me, I, uh, I know a lot of Armenians, a lot of Kurds, a lot of people from Turkoman origins, in Lebanon, and I have no, uh, 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 I, I don't, uh, let's say, uh, uh, differentiate between them. So my, my attitude towards each and every one of them is based on his personal character. Exactly. Okay. So, but at a time when there were people about to get extinct, to be wiped out, to be eradicated, focusing and insisting on identity is, a, is very crucial at this time. For example, I was always critical of Arab regimes and sometimes some aspects of Arab culture. However, especially lately, with this attack on everything that is Arab, I started to be more defensive uh, of the Arab identity and of the Arab heritage, okay? And again, I became, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, I, I, I started to get irritated whenever I would hear an insult of the Arab. Uh -huh. So, the, there is uh, uh, protecting an identity is one thing, and being fascist is totally different. Exactly, Na nationalism and fascism is uh, uh, there. There are differences among them. Uh, patriotism is different from nationalism as well, and this is what I try also to. What explain. is An Angela Merkel? Mm -hmm. She is very nationalist. Macron is very nationalist. Trump and Biden. Both are nationalists. So why would we accept for the West what we would be ashamed of for ourselves? Yes. Unfortunately, I'm following... Uh... By the way, Fidel was nationalist in Cuba. Yes. The communist Cuba, the, 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 the central figure in Cuba, in communist Cuba, is not communist. It's Jose Marti, a liberal, the forefather of Cuban independence. And by the way, <laughs> uh, there is a nice book that I read a few years ago. The title is Comrades. Mm -hmm. And he was analyzing nationalist dimension of communist regimes in the Soviet Union, China, uh, North Korea, Cuba, and a fifth country. I don't remember. It was we need we need to make another uh, video and another episode about this issue. I just Definitely. I'm always ready. By the way.
Thank you very much, Dr. Jamal Wakim, Professor of International Relations and History. is based in Lebanon. Guys, I will also put his uh, account link in the description below if you understand Arabic or you want to read his uh, opinions that he posts on Facebook as well. And if you are new, and uh, I'm Syrian Analysis. I also invite you to hit the subscribe button and it really helps me a lot to increase my audience uh, around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamal. Thank you. My pleasure.